Welcome to the SGV Master Key, a show where you will hear personal stories of triumph over failures and how others successfully navigated the unique landscape that is the San Gabriel Valley. What makes us different? Well, just like you, we have chosen the San Gabriel Valley for our home or businesses or both. We believe it is the people and small businesses that make this community great, and we love to share their stories with you. We always encourage your questions and feedback, and you can find all of our contact information at sgvmasterkey.com. Here are the hosts for the show, Russell Mono and Scott Warman. All right, welcome back to another episode. Scott, by now the listeners know you're an attorney, and uh Part of what you do is to help people settle things, right? Uh, Help people resolve problems. Um, One of the problems that we, though, have in the legal profession is that, you know, we're trained as if we're adversaries. It's an adversary training, you know, it's an adversary system. And quite often that means people think they need to fight about it. But actually, there are better ways than resolving, uh, better ways than that of resolving things. And that sort of leads us into our guest today, who is also an attorney, uh, but is um, working to maybe overcome the adversarial system and help people resolve problems in other ways. All right. And so, like you said, our guest today is an attorney, uh, Randy Sotomayor. Welcome to the show, Randy. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. So uh, you are an attorney, and like we said, you you help to resolve things, but uh, what is your connection to the San Gabriel Valley? Well, when I, I, I have been in practice for about 37 years, and after 27 of those working in a downtown law firm, uh, downtown LA, I decided I was going to go out on my own uh, and start my own mediation practice. I had no idea what, what it took to start a business. And consequently, I set up my home office. I sent out a letter to all the lawyers I'd met over 27 years. And what happened? Not too much. <laughs> and and uh, one of the things, I went and got some help with marketing. And one of the things I did was send letters to various chambers of commerce. And uh, one of them was the San Gabriel Chamber of Commerce. And Executive Director Sandy Roscoe got me involved. And that's how I started here. And I started out on my own with my own practice and it. And it's built from there. And I've learned a lot. And Sandy's helped you a lot, I bet. Sandy has helped me a lot. She got me a really good uh, referral uh, lo- years ago. And Sandy, she, she's just like everybody's personal PR representative. And, and she helped quite a bit. She's always trying to help and always, you know, taking the lead for her members. So, you know, she's, she's very helpful. She was a guest on our show uh, probably... Number eight. Number eight, yeah. And uh, so she, she was great. She was a great guest. And she, in fact, recommended that we have you as a guest. Yeah. And uh, She's a very generous person. Yeah, very supportive I, I, and generous, right? So you, where is your practice located then in the San Gabriel Valley? Absolutely. I, I have been fortunate to have a home office because traditionally uh, I would go as a mediator uh, to other attorneys' offices to conduct the mediation. Um, sometimes I would get space if other, others did not have a suitable conference room space. And then, let's see, after things started turning around uh, 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 for me in terms of uh, working as a mediator full-time, I found a need to have some regular space and have parties and counsel come to my office. So I took space uh, at the 215 North Marengo building near the courthouse and, and had a terrific um, 
arrangement with Vern Murray, who's the owner of that building, uh, to use their conference facilities when I need them. So that's right in Alhambra. No, that's uh, right in Pasadena, oh, that's Pasadena. across uh, from the courthouse. That's right, yeah, on Marengo. Okay, yeah, right. When you okay. were working in downtown LA, were you also in mediation? Yes. You, you know, I, I trained in mediation in 1999, but I started working through the LA Superior Court as a mediator in 2004. And so I combined my litigation practice with uh, mediation practice because I, when I started using mediators as an advocate, I really uh, was drawn to it because I actually practiced my uh, law in a somewhat collaborative way. When I was a very, very young lawyer, I could not understand why opposing counsel, and, and we were defense counsel, so opposing counsel was typically plaintiff's counsel. I was saying, why are you being so belligerent and obstreperous? And I got an answer. And the answer was, well, we expect you to paper us to death or beat us up because you're a big firm and you have lots of money. So I needed to explain to them, listen, my, my clients don't pay me to harass people. And I, if I need to send you three interrogatories, I'm only going to send you three. I'm not going to send you 30 to make work. And frankly, I'm too busy. And, and so I always tried to work things out early with claimants uh, and their counsel. And this was always my way. So, and there I, are a good number of attorneys, uh, defense, uh, as well as uh, on plaintiff's side, that that have that kind of attitude. But not everyone does. No, I have found that a lot of attorneys, trial attorneys, can't turn off their trial attorney persona. Mediation is an opportunity to take a break from the war and put yourself into another mentality, a resolution mentality. And counsel uh, in Southern California in particular, over the many years, um, have changed what, has supposed to, what was supposed to have been a break from the war into another component of litigation, often used as a tool a litigation strategic tool uh, so that they don't let down their competitive I want to win mentality. This happens a lot, but, but usually since something like 95, 98% of civil cases settle before trial um, or are otherwise disposed of by motions, most of them settle. Most clients want an earlier less expensive resolution, most importantly, to keep the anxiety and the lack of productivity and the diversion of litigation off their back. They need to move on. What you're doing now is um, devoting your full-time, full-time efforts to trying to resolve things early on rather than uh, have litigation extend out. Uh, it's more costly, more time-consuming, and nobody's happy usually in that kind of situation. But this is fairly new to the business, to the industry. Um, it's really, I've been practicing for a little over 35 years, and I seem to remember, if I can try to date it, you know, maybe sometime in the 90s, you really started to see real effort, <coughs> excuse me, efforts to... Um, to quicken uh, resolution, and, and that's when we started to see the uh, companies like uh, Jams and uh, some of the res uh, th These are companies that s that focus on resolving cases, private uh, private uh, attempts as opposed to a court ordered settlement conference. But you're the expert. Why don't you explain it to us? <laughs> Well, it started, it, it gained a lot of popularity in the 90s 
one of my mentors was actually, I believe, opened his practice in 1989, something like that. Um, I became aware. I started started using mediators in the in the 90s, as you said. Um, first through the court program, the courts figured that there was a way of of lightening the load and serving the client's interests uh, by having not just judges conduct uh, uh, mandatory or voluntary settlement conferences, but the court opened up an, an alternative dispute resolution office and started referring parties and counsel to that office for mediation. And there was also, as you said, the, the advent of alternative dispute resolution provider organizations, and such as JAMS or ADR services. Um, and they are basically panels of mediators um, that they do the administrative work for. And I remember so vividly one of the first private mediations I had and, and how effective it was um, and helpful and, and, and gave parties a safe space to be honest and open and frank with each other without fear of having what they said used against them later in the case. But I know that there are a lot of cases that are very complex and maybe they're not strict civil cases. Maybe they involve uh, things like family law, which is more, you know, um, uh, difficult to deal with because of the emotions, et cetera. But uh, let's take family law as an example. It can be a very brutal process. Do you get involved in those kind of cases? I do not get involved in family law cases per se because that's an area of law that's really quite a specialty. And the mediation of family law matters such as divorce and child custody um, is actually conducted in a different way than, than commercial litigation, uh, commercial mediation. Um, but I do get a lot involved in a lot of cases involving family dynamics. There are, and, and in fact, it's a bit of a tangent, but I find that commercial cases are fraught with very intense emotions. Uh, w one of the few things that make people the most emotional is money. And uh, when people are fighting over money, the passions are very great. But within families, I have dealt with um, estate issues, conservatorships, children, uh, adult children in disputes with their parents over, over disposition of real property. Um, I have even dealt with a civil cause of action in the midst of a family law dispute where the mother was not given visitation rights and we had to separate the family law issues from the, from the, money issue, but they were necessarily interrelated. Working with people's emotions is a vital component of any mediation, because even if it's an insurance company, for, first of all, you have an aggrieved claimant or third-party claimant, um, and, and people are people. And a lot of times, if you have an insurance adjuster on the other side, a lot of people think, they are just the big bad defendant. They've got tons of money. We all know that. But you have to think of the adjuster. The adjuster has to abide by standards of the insurance industry in managing claims. If they don't have their files uh, comply with the standards of the law and the company, they get audited. Those people can lose their jobs. So an insurance company also is a human because commercial entities can only uh, uh, act through people and people are emotional beings. So 
that's a little bit into your your work. Uh, this show we like to also get into how you came to be. So, can you share your early years? What is uh, uh, Randy's childhood like, and how did you come to this profession? You know, I often say that being a lawyer is ninety percent personality and ten percent training. I think that's why a lot of people don't like lawyers a lot because we're really nitty and meticulous and ask a lot of questions and very curious. And I was always kind of that way as a child. Uh, I remember at the dinner table, we, I was only one of two children. So there were four of us there. My brother was three and a half years older than I. And I remember being really little and saying, I eject, I eject. <laughs> Eject. And, <laughs> for object. Okay. I object. Um, and I had a hard time getting a word in. But then in sophomore year of college, my father told me I needed to have a goal. I mean, I'm going to college. What, what, what's your plan? And I said, I'm one of those people in that generation where we didn't know what we were going to do. So, okay, we're going to go to law school. And then you know, I, I just think that way anyway. So end of senior year of college comes, and I decided to go to an on-campus interview for a New York retailer because I thought it would be really fun to go into to retail and, and move to New York City. And I'm sitting in this interview in New York, and I, I was asked what, what alternatives I'm considering, and, and the alternative was law school. And and I just started talking about law. And, and I really blew that interview. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I went a natural path for me. Okay. And, and where did you go to school? Um, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and uh, went to a private girls' school at the time. Um, I could go on and on about the Baltimore community and and. The, the way communities are there, but that's, that's, that, that, that is a whole nother show. Um, I went to college at Duke University in North Carolina, and I went to law school at Washington University in St. Louis. Okay. And you have a not so much unique name, but a unique spelling of the name. Can you, can you share with the listeners what that's about? Well, I've been, I, I asked my parents that for many <laughs> years, and, and I, all I get I, I say, why did you spell my name that way? Huh. And the answer was never and the answer. It, they said, we were going to name you Robin. I said, well, that's not an answer to the question. <laughs> See, that's where so the personality lawyer. comes in, right? <laughs> and, and I'll bet you sued your parents. <laughs> no, my parents <laughs> were. And my parents, I'm a very, very lucky person. Um, compared to most people, every every family, every person has their secrets, has their skeletons, and and no family is is immune from that. But I was very very fortunate to have the most loving family, and and creative and smart and supportive to this day. My dad passed 15 years ago. Uh, from pancreatic cancer, but at that time he was in better physical condition before he got the cancer than I w ever was at that time. So, what did your parents do? Yeah. So, oh, well, I, I'm going to answer that question though. I asked oh. the question about um, oh, yeah. uh, uh, your how name. They, so, yeah. I, the answer was we thought it was more feminine. Go figure. A hundred percent of the time, when people don't know who I am, they think I'm male. So, that's <laughs> that's the lousy answer to that question. So it didn't really work out the way they had hoped, huh? <laughs> no, they had their boy first, and then they had their girl, <laughs> and I apparently was the easier one. <laughs> well, what, were, what did your parents do? What was your life like growing up in Baltimore? Well, um, my background is Jewish, and my um, grandparents were immigrants around the turn of the 20th century. Uh, all came from Lithuania, Latvia area, and they, they took uh, boats, you know, steerage passengers um, that, that came directly to Baltimore, Maryland. Most immigrants from Eastern Europe came through um, 
New York City, Ellis Island. But somehow my family ended up on ships that, that landed it directly in Baltimore. And so my dad grew up working in, in his parents. They had like a little sundries soda fountain mm-hmm. shop. And my mother's fa- uh, family had a grocery store or something like that. My father was the first in his family, among the first, to go to college after uh, World War II. He was a tail gunner in the uh, Air Force. And my mom studied opera at the Peabody Institute in Baltimore. So when I was a child, she, she would sing um, in churches and temples in the city, and I, I would hear her. It was amazing. And, and my father went to uh, University of Maryland for college, and then he went on to dental school. And he became, he, he was a private dentist, and he became really an innovator in his, in his field. I remember all these meetings at the house. There'd be six colleagues sitting around talking ab- about I, what I didn't know then, and I know now, was practice management. Mm-hmm. Was your ethnic um, background, was that a big part of your life? Were you a strong part of the ethnic community? We were not. My father grew up in an Orthodox household, and he really rejected that. Um, they, they mistreated him in the school, and the household, though, was, was fine, but never suggest putting mayo on a corned beef sandwich because he grew up not mixing dairy and meat. Oh, yes. But the, the ethnic component is the fact that, at least in Baltimore, as in many places, there was you know, a community. Um, and the interesting thing was when Jewish people started going to the private schools that were um, traditionally attended by, not, you know. Wasp. Yeah, there you go. Well, except that they, except in the state of Maryland, there were many, many Catholics, mm. and I. It's I'm embarrassed to admit that it wasn't until college that I knew that Catholics had been a persecuted uh, group because Maryland was founded uh, as a Catholic colony, and when I was living there, so many of our friends, acquaintances, people around were Catholic. I thought that was just. Oh, I normal. didn't know that. I didn't realize that that Maryland was, you say, founded as a Catholic. I might I might be wrong, but it, but basically that that's my understanding. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah, but that's interesting that um, the Catholic uh, component would be so strong there. I I, I just didn't realize. It. Yes, yes, and I was so, Babe Ruth a Catholic? I don't know. <laughs> um, where. So I was superficially part of the Jewish community, but then when my brother, my brother went off to the private school first, and they, when he was in seventh grade, they threw pennies at him because he was Jewish. Oh, and by the time he left... That was an insult. Yes, yes. Um, and by the time he left, he got the award for... Um, being like incredibly helpful and compassionate, especially with the younger boys. And uh, later in life, he was on their board of directors and is a stellar alum. And the school I went to, uh, we didn't, we didn't feel it the same way. I I, I was four years behind him. Um, But there was, there was a consciousness, but that was not a big part of our life. It was, our life was really work hard, you know, study well. Did you experience any of that here in Southern California? Uh, like discrimination? Hmm. None. I went to, uh, I came out to Los Angeles uh, and started work with a law firm called Adams, Dukey and Hazeltine. And they, they, that firm was begun in 1946 and was known as one of those white shoe traditional law firms where they didn't take uh, uh, Jewish people or black people or, you know, anybody. Uh, But by the time I got there in 1983, 
They had a woman on the executive committee, one of the few, and a lot of women associates. Um, I was a very fortunate associate. I, I thank generations of women who came before me. When I went to school, it never even occurred to me that I would have a problem progressing as a woman. Never, never even dawned on me. And I always thanked those who, who went before because I had to reflect. I had to reflect on the work that came before me uh, that gave me easy paths to success. And uh, so Los Angeles um, has been for me a place where I can feel completely at home. Uh, I wanted, I, I was considering going back to Baltimore, but I felt that I felt that I was going to be in my brother's shadow. I probably would have been. Mm. Um, he really is a super, I call him a saint. He's everybody's trustee. Mm. And, um, and I just wanted to make my own way. I, I didn't want to have any pre, preconceived notions of who I was um, and, and where I came from. And y- you know, when you meet somebody else who comes from Baltimore, the first question that anybody asks is, where did you go to school? Because where you went to high school defines you in the city of Baltimore. Well, I have another story about a, a man I met last year who came from Baltimore, but from a completely different experience, um, a, 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 an African-American gentleman who had the opposite experience in the city of Baltimore, which is similar to what uh, black people are experiencing today. Yeah. Um, speaking, going back to your point of women paving the way, I, I used to work at a med mal defense firm uh, in Mid- Mid Wilshire district and the attorney there won the uh, defense attorney of the year. And, uh, she said that they had to delay the plaque or something because a woman had not won either ever or not in a long time. And they had to switch the figurine on top. Yeah. Wow. That was uh, Denise Taylor. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Nope. I'm sorry. <laughs> Los Angeles has an enormous uh, legal community and it's a little frustrating only because, you know, when, when I used to go to court, I mean, there, and get cases, I always get new attorneys that I haven't heard, heard uh-huh. of before. Does that happen to you, Scott? Well, I, you know, I used to be uh, a mediator, um, and I, would, I was one of the, at the beginning of the maybe 2000s, you know, the court had court-appointed mediators. Clients, uh, I shouldn't say clients, but attorneys would come to my office you know, I would devote a certain number of hours to, um, but I never knew any of these people, you know, uh, yeah, it's a big, it's a big, but it's a big community. You don't know a lot of the people, but now that I practice mainly in the San Gabriel Valley, I know a lot of the names. Well, the, the San Gabriel Valley and Pasadena in particular is somewhat unique. It is its own legal community in a way. And um, a lot of people do know each other within this part of, of metropolitan Los Angeles. Yeah, so th- this is a little bit different. But when I was working downtown or in, in West L.A., um, y- you know, a lot of these people were strangers. I, I didn't know who they were. You, you would deal with them for, for the first time when you dealt with them. But what's interesting, my, one of my ex-partners went on, uh, left, the firm I was with and he moved up to a small town in Washington state and there may be 20 attorneys in the whole town. So every case is a conflict. Every single case is a conflict, but somehow they learn to deal with it that, you know, they know every attorney they're dealing with. Right. I think that's the norm in most of the country. It must be. If you think about it, I mean, LA is a big city. There's even San Francisco. It's a much smaller bar. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's not near as big. So it's funny, you know, we we practice in the L.A. area. We don't know who we're dealing with. We don't know their backgrounds. We don't know their reputations sometimes. Uh, you know, in, in a smaller town, everybody knows who they're dealing with. You, that you probably know each other's clients. You, 
you know the attorneys and there's conflicts everywhere well it depends on oh, that, that's right and, and it depends how far you want to take the concept of conflict because there's nothing more precious to a mediator than his or her reputation for impartiality fairness and and treating people the same no matter what uh, for their neutrality is vital and critical. And that's the reputation you want to have. But it's gotten to the point where uh, sometimes I get asked, how many cases have you mediated for this attorney or that attorney? And uh, it, it, it's, it, I haven't lost a case yet for that reason, but um, people are really sensitive these days about, about bias. Well, you know, it's, it's long been a thing where people would, where attorneys would forum shop, look for a particular judge or a particular court that has a particular uh, bias one way or another and try to get your case into that court or in, or in front of that judge. So forum shopping. But I've found that a lot of people, uh, I say people, I mean attorneys that are practicing Try to do the same with the mediator. You know, I have heard that. Um, and I, again, I don't, I don't practice that way. Um, that's really just a rumor. I mean, the people I have learned from and follow are the best in the business. Um, I was incredibly honored. I'm still just amazed when I was invited to join this organization called the International Academy of Mediators, which is uh, a, an organization of a couple hundred mediators from all over the world uh, in commercial mediation. And they set the standard. They are the gold standard for ethics and competence in mediation practice most of these people are, are real superstars. And, and these are the people I learned from. But I brought a sensitivity and a mentality to it of fairness and, and helping people resolve their problems. And why, would, why in the world would I have some interest in, in it's an intentional interest now, everybody, something I've been studying for, for quite some time is the concept of implicit bias. Um, and implicit bias is bias, bias that you can't control. You're not even aware of. It's just part of your uh, upbringing. It, and, and, and that's actually a really big part of what's at the root of uh, ethnic, eth ethnic discord. There are people who just don't even know what they're thinking or saying that degrades people and, and keeps them there. But for, for me, I guess the idea behind forum shopping, judge shopping, uh, is, you know, that's some attorney's idea of zealous advocacy to try and find someone who regularly uh, uh, will decide in favor of one client or another. Statistically, I believe that there's a, some enormous percentage of employment arbitrations that end up in, uh, in favor of the defense, but it may be, I don't know what, what, why that actually is, um, but if, so, if more than three quarters of employment cases, employment arbitrations as distinct from mediations, it's very important to make that distinction, uh, are, are being defensed, as they say, then there's something about the cases that proceed that far. But it, you, most, you know, I do encounter lawyers. Do you ever encounter lawyers who don't know the difference between mediation and arbitration? Um, not that I know of, but I think in the general public, it's a confusing 
difference. It it, I, it is, yeah. and but you actually find attorneys who don't know the difference. I do, wow. I do, and it, it is you know just just so you know, uh, arbitration is much like a trial in court. Uh, it's just that the rules are a little bit more informal, and the process moves more quickly, and you pay for it, and um, not through your taxes, but through your extra money, <laughs> after tax money, and you. Uh, so an arbitrator listens to the evidence and makes a decision: who wins uh, and who loses. Um, in mediation, the mediator is. Uh, again, a neutral third party, but the mediator does not make any decisions about who's right, who's wrong, who should win, who should lose. Uh, the mediator is not allowed to give legal advice. And so those questions, what should we do, have to be answered on the basis of my experience as a, as a litigator, um, uh, experience in the court of appeal, um, practical worldview, experience in mediation, um, and, and, and getting people to understand that communication is so often at the root of the dispute. People don't hear each other. People only want to be heard. And it, it, it's, it's uh, a crucial Interest actually, it's a it's a crucial problem and a very great interest of mine about people listening to each other these days. Yeah, I have, I have so many questions. Uh, I know my my wife would have so many questions too, mostly because we we opted against mediation. Um, in all of our research, as you know, reasons why mediation is not advised, we hit a lot of those check marks. Um, really so history of substance abuse power dynamic um, yeah the history of acting not in good faith and the fact that if we went to mediation nothing could be used in court and so uh, I know I know I'm dying to ask this question you know what do you do with a, a character disturbed person someone a psychopath sociopath well it is problematic um that one, that, that one case that I mentioned at the beginning that, that was mostly a family law matter and, but had this, this uh, commercial or financial aspect to it, the mom did not have custody because of a substance abuse problem, and, but, but she was represented by an attorney uh, and, and in the mediation, which makes a difference. Um, because then you have, sometimes the attorney can use the help of the mediator to communicate with the client. And that, that ranges for all kinds of clients, but, those, but usually those who are often irrationally stuck in their own anger. And so if there's counsel... I will work with counsel to, to help communicate consequences of actions to the, to the party represented. If the party is not uh, uh, represented, I really just try to understand where they're coming from. And that's what's most important. It's not just the parties and counsel listening to each other. It is vitally important for the mediator to try and connect with whoever the party is, no matter what their condition. So even somebody who is, you know, irrational, they do appreciate the effort to understand where they are. Do you think you're able to recognize when someone has a deficiency in, in areas of like, let's say, uh, emotional intelligence, empathy, uh, when they're severely lacking in that, like, uh, how do you adjust what you do uh, when you encounter someone like that? Well, I think about what does it take to keep somebody at the table? And so you, you, 
that's where, that's the sort of the next step of, of what I was just talking about in, in terms of understanding where people are. Um, it's like, it's like I'm on your side when I'm in your room and I'm on your side when I'm in the other room, I, I, I'm in the other side side when I'm in the other room. I also will sometimes be the bad guy in both rooms. So there, there are points of view that sometimes just don't make sense. And I will sometimes say, well, you know, you look at, you look at the dispute this way, but the judge and the jury, what, what are you going to do if the judge and the jury sees it a different way? What are you going to do? Is, is that possible? And often that triggers a thought. Oh, of course they're going to see it my way. Of course they are, but, but what if? I guess this is a little bit off into a, a tangent of a topic because um, I'm, I'm describing someone who has, let's say, is in te- could be intentionally operating in bad faith, that the mediation process could be just a way to gather information with no intention of settling and just gathering this information that cannot be used in court and then to litigate further. Uh, that individual uh, could exist. And I, I was just curious, like, how do you, how do you weed that person out or what do you do in that specific circumstance? Because uh, that's part of the reason why we, we chose not to mediate. Um, and we, we ended up uh, you know, going to, to trial. But Do you um, see that where you have a party that comes in intentionally trying to use it in, for bad purposes? I have seen, and I, I know it's actually somewhat common, to use it for, as some attorneys would say, free discovery. Exactly. And, and so that doesn't, the confidentiality of the process does not prevent somebody from leaving mediation, not having resolved the case, and then propounding discovery uh, to look for information that the mediation uh, revealed. And, and, but what I find, hmm, I, have, I have one now where they're using the process just to go, I, I feel that they are going by the book, but they know that going by the book is, is making it difficult for the, for the other side. So is that bad faith to go by the book? Um, you know, it, it, I, I'm not sure it is. I think it's commonly known that people will, you know, use it for free discovery, but at the end of the day, you don't have to disclose your smoking gun, or, but, but I encourage most people to do that because usually that prompts a settlement. But if they're going to just, uh, I, I, it's not really possible to weed that out in advance. Um, sometimes, sometimes you do get somebody who's irrational, um, and and you just go through the process with them, and it, you can tell with what if they're trying to get information that you know, the other side doesn't want to give and we don't give it up. We don't give it over. Hey. I mean, the discomfort is really, if you're in mediation and you're uncomfortable about something, I'll work on that with you. We got to figure it out. The key, the heart of the process is the trust of the mediator. If you do not trust the mediator, you're not going to have a good experience. You really need the trust. Um, And if that's not there, then you may as well not have come in the first place. What is the skill that you need to use most in your position as a mediator? Listening. I'm, and and I I challenge myself with that every day because I'm, as you can tell, a big talker. And I really need to listen and one of the ways I practice listening is by repeating 
what I've understood someone to say to me. It slows me down, and I make sure I understand. I also write a lot. It's one of the ways I, I remember stuff. Um, I write it down, but then I just, I just want to make sure I understand what you're telling me. And a lot of times I get thanked for my understanding at the end of the, of the day. Sometimes I'll have, say, say a, a party that you can tell was responsible for some damage that the, uh, the claimant is making. And I will go at, at, with them, I will talk with them about how important their reputation is because it is important. And if somebody messed up, you know, let's just make it right. Let's just make it right. Well, you had an incredible story of an 18-year saga or saga. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, uh, what was that all about? You want to show your Yes. So this, is, this was one of my very, very favorite cases. Um, this is a thank you note I got from one of the parties. There, there was... It was a dispute between a brother and a sister later in life uh, over the um, inheritance from their mom. Their mom had been sick for 12 years, and the daughter and son-in-law, the sister and, and her husband, took care of her for that time, and the brother lived out of state. And they came to an agreement and signed a written agreement about the uh, inheritance, taking into account the work that the, the sister had done for the mom over the years. And then for some reason, what, uh, there, there was no dis distribution at, after mom passed. And there was, I think it went back more than 18 years, but you know, to childhood, all the, all the way back to he, he scared me or I never felt part of the family. And so we resolved the, the disbursement of, of the inheritance pretty quickly, but I could see in these people sort of a yearning. And they were so sad. And I said, I asked each of them, do, do you want to talk to your brother? Do, do you want to talk to your sister? And they did. And in the meantime, both of their spouses had been um, encouraging them, you know, to stand up for themselves all during the fight. Well, they resolved to start talking to each other on the phone uh, f starting then without their spouses on the phone with them. And there was this, I met with them, just the two of them and me, and there was a lot of tear there were a lot of tears and hugs at the end and a new beginning and i received this thank you card from them it's just beautiful and with a 3d pop out of a bouquet of flowers and the husband of the of the of the um, sisters said randy thank you for being fair compassionate and caring and the sister writes, Dear Randy, thank you for your amazing ability to bring closure to a very long 18 years conflict. I can enjoy the rest of my life without this burden in my life. May your gifts continue to set other people free. And to feel that I had some part in that is probably one of the most rewarding parts of my practice ever. Very, very, very um, wonderful feeling. And, 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 and one of the main reasons I evolved into being a mediator. Well, yeah. And when you can impact someone's life like that for, for good, that's extremely fulfilling. And uh, those kinds of memories really will stick with you forever. Uh, we also see that you brought something else with you here. Care to share about that? 
Yes, this is a really, really big part of my life. Just over the last seven years or so, um, and, I, and, and something I discovered I never had. What I brought were a number of medals from running races. And I was never much of a, a nature person, and I was the least athletic person in the United States. <laughs> I mean, I hated sports. I didn't enjoy watching them. I was incompetent at them. I couldn't run. Everything hurt. I tripped, I tripped over my feet on flat concrete. And, I mean, I was so bad that senior year of high school, when I made a basketball, like a basket, the game stopped and everyone applauded. I mean, it, it, it was bad. I was on JV badminton, and I, <laughs> and I always choked. Um, but, but one, I live in the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains, in Altadena, and one day a neighbor set up a a hike among neighbors. And it seems that there are all these trails right behind my house. And I discovered a world in the San Gabriel Mountains that I never knew existed before. It was enthralling. And then I became part of, this neighbor introduced me to a hiking group. It was a meetup group. And uh, they would go mostly in the San Gabriels. They were a fast group. If you stopped to blow your nose, they were gone. I mean, they were really gone. And I got got really tired of showing up last. (laughs) and Because you show up where they're waiting for you, and then they take off again. So you get no break. (laughs) So my goal was, I want a longer break. (laughs) And and that worked out. And then one day, I went uh, with this same friend, up the Mount Wilson Trail for the first time. And it was really tough. I mean, that's a tough trail. And we came down, we went to the Lizzie's Inn, and there was a docent there who said, well, how'd you like it? T- today was the first day of the free training for the Mount Wilson Trail Race. I'm like, what? what? I almost died coming down that hill. And he said, well, you can hike it. So I went home, got my husband and said, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to the Saturday training. And that's what we did. And somehow I started running. Um, I I started, the running started a little bit before that because in the hiking, in the hiking, we'd go on progressively longer and more difficult hikes up to 21 miles. And it would get really, really long at the end. And I just wanted out of there. So I'd start running just to get out of there. And then after uh, we started preparing for Mount Wilson Trail Race, I went to the, uh, the Santa Anita Derby Day 5K. And oddly, after two months of, of running, I came in seventh in my age group. I was, at, that, at the time, it was 50 to, 55 to 59 for, for road. Trail is 50 to 59. And I don't know, it all just took off from there. And... I, I discovered a speed, um, and, and for me, it, 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 it's actually rather meditative because I like the trails, much more, running on the trails much more than running on the road. It's easier on uh, older knees, but I guess my legs were fairly fresh, f- never having done any sports, and it, it, it's just glorious to be out there in the mountains with the vistas and, and the streams and not so many people. And being a part of that world, it, it was just so exciting. But then if you're running on a trail, you really had better uh, pay attention to every single step you take because there's rocks and cliffs and there's no guardrails and <laughs> the trails are you know two feet wide and, and uh, sometimes you're clambering over ledges. And so it takes a tremendous amount of focus. And I do like to listen to music because I, I work on my cadence that way. Um, but, but I really progressed. And so I, I, it turns out I placed like one, two, or three in a lot of my, in my age division in a number of races. And so today I brought um, the... One of the ones I'm so proud of. Uh, you can hold it up. You can oh. to this camera here. Oh, there. Okay. 
So this one is the, uh, I believe, 2017 Pasadena Trail Race Series Half Marathon. Starts at Hahamanga Park and goes up to um, Ken Burton Saddle and up the El Prieto Trail and down the, uh, I, I believe, Fern Truck Trail. And this day, I, I saw a friend at the beginning and, and I knew that there was going to be at least one other woman who always beat me by five minutes. I mean, a really experienced runner. And my friend says to me, I say, you know, I always lose to her. And he, he says, not today. <laughs> and so I took off and I was 59 years old and, I, and I'm at the top at the Ken Burton saddle. And there she is. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I'm going to learn something. And so I, I stayed behind her, but I watched her. And, and sometimes I get to the top and then just start bombing down the hill. Um, but I, I, I knew I had, you know, some mileage. So I'm, I decided to follow what, what she was doing. And, and I reserved, I reserved longer, but then I got to this hill down near the, um, uh, JPL and I had to go flying down it cause it's pretty se- uh, steep. And I just kept pushing and I, sh- I was sure she was on my heels and, and I didn't dare look back, but at some point I was so tired and I, and, and I had to walk even a couple, couple parts of it. I come tearing into the, to the uh, end, and lo and behold, at 59 years old, I took first place in the 50 to 59 division uh, f- uh, in that trail race. The elevation gain was 1,800 feet. Um, oh, congratulations. Yeah. That is remarkable. Do you know what, do you remember what your time was? Uh, oh, I have it. I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, but I, but I, that's a 13.1 mile run, right? Right. And when it's trails, sometimes it's longer than that. Mm. Um, I have this here, uh, the Ray Miller also from 2017. This is a 50, uh, they have a 50 mile, a 50 K and a 50, and a 30 K at the time. I ran the 50K, and, uh, which is about 32 miles, 31, 32 miles. This is out in Malibu um, above the water. And again, really competitive participants. Uh, this one, I ran the 50K, 32 miles in seven hours and 26 minutes um, with something like a 7,500 foot gain wow. something like that I, I i was and i was only 10th in my age division um it just goes to show you the nature of the competition yeah but, but that's that was still, still an incredible time uh yeah incredible time right the next one the next one is uh from the santa anita 5k you know that first time i went and i was i was seventh um and then i there was a couple of times i kept coming in fourth Oh, fourth is such a horrible place. <laughs> and um, so, again, in the mid- middle of a, a race, I'm starting to flag kind of in the last quarter of it. And the next thing I hear, a friend comes up, says very softly to me one word, push. And I did. And finally, second place in uh, uh, among 200 and 279, 280 women ages 55 to 59. I was 59, um, and there are about four, four, 5,000 people in that race. Wow. Um, the last one I brought is the LA Marathon uh, Finisher's Medal. The LA Marathon. I don't. I don't like to run road, but so I told. I told myself I'm going on a running tour of the city of Los Angeles, and that's what I did. And it was so much fun, to to run through each neighborhood and see them, uh, congratulate and cheer you on, what, in every single neighborhood. What year did you do that? This is uh, 2017. 
you did a lot of running that year. That was a very good year. 2018 was a pretty good year, too. We also do, we did these crazy things. Um, a group I was in every year had an annual overnight 50K in, in the San Gabriel Mountains. And we would start somewhere, teams, teams groups, um, and we would go, they called it a 50K. The first year I went for 45 miles because we made a seven-mile navigational error. We were out 18 hours. It rained the whole time, and I had such a ball. It was so great. Wait a minute. Were you running 18 hours? or we, Well, you... You walk some of it, and, oh, okay. and then we, we, all- we were, you know, trying to find our way. <laughs> and uh, that time we were out around Cogswell Dam. But uh, last, the last time I did it, we did the entire Gabrielino Trail from uh, below, from Santa Anita Road below the gate, ending up all the way down uh, in West Pasadena on La Loma Road, having gone up uh, all the way up wow. over the mountains through through uh, r- over Mount Wilson, all the way down into West Fork, all the way to Red Box, which is at the road where you t- that turns off to Mount Wilson. Um, Do you know these Switzer's. places, Russell? Yeah, if you t- if, if from there, if you come down Switzer's Bear Canyon to JPL, mm-hmm. yeah, extraordinary, and to see the sunrise. Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, all, all of these feats are, are, are really incredible, and they tell a lot about the person that you are. Yeah, you have to know something about elevation gain and, and distance to know that, but because these are these are not easy, and not easy just to do on their own, but to to place as you did is is quite an accomplishment. It, it you know I I think that we surprise ourselves so often and and this coincided with me starting my business in earnest um and and it's you know people ask me why how i trained and the true answer is that i chased people <laughs> uh, there were you know everybody was getting more of a break i had to chase them i wanted a break um <laughs> And I just, I, I, I was determined uh, to make the most of each day and to, make, and, to, and to really immerse myself in that incredibly beautiful and awe-inspiring world in the San Gabriel Mountains. It, it, it is a beautiful, gorgeous place. Yeah, it really is a treat for everyone who lives in the San Gabriel Valley to have the mountains, you know, just right here, yeah, five ten minutes drive away. Scott and I have mentioned a lot on this program how we hike, and uh, we've made it competitive for ourselves. And interest, interestingly enough, he does better uh, in the lead, and I do better trying to catch him. So <laughs> we will set a time. Which and she a always distance. does, incidentally. <laughs> <laughs> no, not always, not always, but um. Yeah, so so his drive, I guess, to to stay ahead is very strong, and my drive to to catch up is is also very strong. <laughs> but uh, thank you for sharing that story and bringing these in with you today. We uh, we're going to go on to a different part of the program where we get to know uh, some of your favorite places in the San Gabriel Valley. Randy, we call this the SGV three. So. I'd be surprised if one of the trails isn't one of your three favorite, but what are, what are your three favorite? Well, we've lived in the San Gabriel Valley since 1986, um, and I've seen lots of different parts of it. Um, I would say my favorite hub is Chantry Flats uh, above, above uh, Arcadia. Uh, last year, a very close friend of mine, um, who I run with, uh, acquired Chantry Flats from uh, the previous owners. And Chantry Flats is a pack station, and it actually still serves as a pack station. They have uh, nine donkeys, I think. 
that supply the, the historic cabins, the big Santa Anita Canyon. And each, each of those trails, they, they can take you anywhere. And um, she, this was a dream for her. And I've always loved the pack station because, Adam's pack station, because we'd come out of those 21, 20, you know, 15 mile hikes. And we would um, just go there for, to resuscitate and, and go over the hike and, or go over the run. It was a, a really warm and welcoming place. Now, last December, my friend acquired this. She, she wanted mm. to um, improve it, make it kind of a destination. She was in the process of expanding it. And then along came COVID. Um, and then along came fires in July. And then along came the Bobcat fire. Yeah. And Did she, that destroy the, 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 the homes, the cabins that were there? Um, it destroyed 17 of the cabins. Uh, the pack station was saved by, the, by some really dedicated and brave firefighters. Um, the cabins have a homeowners association. And uh, I know that my friend Maggie Moran, who runs the, the, the pack station, and, and she and her husband had just moved there because uh, that's going to be their home. There's a home attached to it. And they evacuated the first day of the fire along with the donkeys. And it, it, it is really an extraordinary um, place. And the losses of the 17 cabins have, have hurt everybody. But the pack station is suffering. And, and the, the chantry is not going to be open for one or two more years um, while, they, while they work on rebuilding the trails and the, the natural so environment. So she is not able to go up to her home there at this point? Or? I think with some um, emergency personnel, uh, they can get things. But I don't think she's been there for a while. I don't know. Um, but her business is non-existent. And this was the first loan she ever took. Really? And, uh, and, and everybody loves Chantry. So, you know, they have a GoFundMe campaign. And, and that, that's a really important place to me because that's where I started with my hiking and running. Um, another uh, favorite, and, and it's gone now, but I think it still exists in many ways, it was Ranchero Mexican Food Restaurant used to be on Foothill at San Gabriel. And Let me think. That sounds from a Foothill and San Gabriel. So, uh, oh, it burned down. Yes. Well, yeah, it burned down. But it was also it was also closed before that. Okay. Um, but it did burn down like within the last year. Yes. And and now there's nothing. But I That's, can tell isn't you, isn't that where there's a Starbucks across, across the, street. the street? Yeah. Okay. It's it's, across. it's on the west side. Okay. So it's not really on San Gabriel. It's it's actually like a little bit more west. Okay. Just yeah, it's on Foothill, just west of the uh, of San Gabriel. Okay. On the north side of the street, and what we what we did there is we became a family. We we'd go every Friday night, and there always be the same regular people there, and and we we started when our kids were tiny. Mm, wow. And, and then people would grow up and move on, but they, everyone would come back. And we made so many friends. And, you know, I know Ranchero isn't the only place like that in the San Gabriel Valley. There are a lot of places that people go to that feel like family to them. And that was really important. We celebrated birthdays there. Uh, you know, our kids had their first legal drinks there. <laughs> uh, wow. We would celebrate with big margaritas, and it was... Did they have their first Ill illegal drinks there as well? No. The, <laughs> oh, the, okay. the, the, you know, Jaime, Jaime never, <laughs> never agreed to that. Absolutely not. And we, we wouldn't put him in that position either. Did it uh, close or did it burn down, which it, led closed, to its closure? They cl closed the business. Um, I don't know exactly why I, I, it was something the family wanted to do something with the land 
and uh, there was a huge celebration at the end. Uh, they had a big party and lots of speeches. It, 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 was, it wow. was sad. There was a lot of crying. Um, we still haven't regrouped anywhere in particular. Mm -hmm. That's unfortunate to lose a place like that. But I know it's still, I know people in the San Gabriel Valley still like that, that kind of experience in their own, you know, special places. Sure. Well, that's two places that they cannot visit. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Uh -oh. yeah, right. That's, um, well, that's number three. a very important place for me is the Pasadena Senior Center, where I am on the board of directors. That place is a hive of humming, vibrant activity. Can't visit it right now. <laughs> but, okay. but it's a leader in activity that is going on right now, online. The place is being visited by great numbers of people suffering from food insecurity in the San Gabriel Valley. Um, the Pasadena Senior Center is a donor-supported operation. It has its building from the city and a small amount of maintenance, but all of its operations are privately are funded by private donations. Um, they serve everybody in our wider San Gabriel community, and so they don't just come from Pasadena; they come from all over the SGV. And they're uh, right now they're they're helping people. They 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 have made six thousand phone calls. Uh, reassurance phone calls to isolated uh, uh, seniors. Um, but at the same time, they are providing the enrichment programs, such as the master's series where they have lectures and uh, musical events and concerts, and it's all and classes all going on online. They have a gym there. Well, they can't go to the gym, but they're having their classes online. Um, they will teach, they teach art, they teach photography, computer skills. There are people, and you go in and it feels like a club. It's, it's really lovely. And Isn't that located near the train station? Um, and there's a park there. Right. Memorial Park Memorial in Pasadena. Park. And, and that's the train, that's the Metro stop. It's right next door. And, uh, they, um, they have music. Uh, uh, concerts, free concerts in, in the park. It, it wasn't just um, the, uh, what was it? The Levitt Pavilion had some, yeah, but uh, at least one of the concerts was sponsored by the Pasadena Senior Center. And they sponsor the Pasadena Senior Games, which is incredibly well um, attended uh, event for those 50 and older who compete in everything from uh, road running to discus throwing and in pickleball, and uh, it, it, it's a really fun activity. So there's a lot going on there, you know, for both social services for for older adults, and um, and enriching and empowering educational services uh, for for everybody. And it's it's a it's just a a vibrant place that that celebrates aging optimally aging well. So I'm, I'm very proud of that, that place. A lot of, lot of good things happen there. Yeah, it sounds like a, a great resource for the community. Um, I'm not going to be going there, but yeah, <laughs> I could. Maybe, maybe Scott <laughs> wants to go and dominate the, the games. <laughs> well, like, like for example, one year, Erwin uh, Chemerinsky came right after Judge, oh. uh, Justice Scalia died. And he was going to talk about the Supreme Court, you know, what, what, it, what they had done um, in, in that year. But he, since Justice Scalia had just passed, he was there discussing what the court was, what was going to happen well, with various cases. That's a high-level discussion because he... I believe he's at Stanford now. That's that's correct. Yeah, is he the dean at Stanford? Or? No, not Stanford. He's at at um, Bolt. Bolt. Oh, Bolt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, at Bolt Hall, um, and 
it is very high level, and you can't imagine the, the level of interest, but they're always putting on, you know, fascinating, yeah. worthy uh, programs. Randy, thank you so much for coming and sharing your 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 journey with our listeners. Uh, how can they get in touch with you if they are interested in your services? Uh, the best way to learn a little bit more about me is to go to my website, which is sotomayorlaw.com and uh, emailing me at randy, R-A-N-D-E, at sotomayor dot, sotomayorlaw.com. That's randy at sotomayorlaw.com. And you said you're not doing family family law, but uh, what are what are the areas that you would uh, practice in? I, I do a lot with uh, businesses, partnerships that might have disputes. Uh, so sometimes I can help uh, partners who maybe end up in a business divorce or they end up staying together and doing better. Um, I, uh, any commercial type of dispute, personal injury disputes uh, and claims, employment uh, uh, actions, um, a lot of real estate disputes, and basically, you know, co- co- commercial, mostly commercial type of business transactions. That's uh, a lot of good information. And uh, for our listeners, uh, it's always interesting to get someone new and uh, diversify the, the show, the guests that are on the show. And the big uh, key to what you do is that you have integrity, and that really is something that would draw people to you. And, and we can tell that. Right. Well, I, I, I can really imagine of no greater compliment. That, that's very special to me. And, and I, I have a mo- motto, and it keeps me open all the time. And the motto is, replace judgment with curiosity. Replace judgment with curiosity. That Just ask questions. Yeah. Yeah. Don't conclude. And thank you so much for having me here today, and especially for that final compliment. Yeah, I, I, thank you. That, that, that does me a great honor. Yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you. Thanks for checking out another episode of the SGV Master Key. You can find the full back catalog of the SGV Master Key at sgvmasterkey.com and wherever you get your podcasts. This show was produced and edited by Russell Mono and Victoria Allers of Kind Monster Productions. Thanks again for listening or watching. We'll see you again real soon in the next episode. Nice mother. No, kind mother.